Pastor. When I was asked to speak today for this TEDx talk, I was so excited when I learned that the theme was vision because this past year I was awarded, not uh, what did you call it, a slew of teaching awards, but I was awarded one of the University of Ottawa's chair in university teaching roles, which is really just a big, nice research grant that covers the next three years of work for me. And what it involves is looking at excellence in the large class. So I, I titled the presentation today, Revisioning the Large Class, as a forum for, or as a milieu or a place for interpersonal relationships, because what I study is communication. And while you might think, well, how can we have communication in a large class? I've taught in this very room before, and it wasn't nice and small and intimate like this. It was filled to the back with about 300 students. So I have a lot of experience in the large class myself, and I'm not one who's gonna say, oh, we have to get rid of the large class. It's probably here to stay. So my interest is, how can we make it an excellent place to learn? So, many of you are students, so you know the reality of the classrooms of today. They're not often as small and intimate as this. They may have 100, 300, 400 students. And why is that? Well, post-secondary institutions like colleges and universities are under so much pressure right now. They're under increasing pressure to try to do, we could say, more with less. Why is that? One reason is that everyone thinks they need a degree. And that may or may not be true, but the perception out there by parents, by students, by industry, is that the university degree, the bachelor degree, is now kind of like the required equivalency of a high school diploma. That if you don't have a, an undergraduate degree, that you're probably not qualified enough to get work. Now, we know that that's not really true, but the perception is that everyone needs education. And actually, I think that's an excellent thing. The more people who are educated, the better. And we'll talk about that in a bit. The other thing is that, the last decade has seen a lot of challenges economically in Canada and in many countries in the world which have led to a lot of unemployment. So where do a lot of people turn when they can't get a job? Back to school. So either they start university or they may come back and get a further education, maybe a master's degree, or maybe they left, work or left the university earlier and have gone out to work and decide to come back and take another degree or continue their degree. So these things have combined to create so many more bodies in the university. And we've seen increases in Ontario anyway in colleges and universities of about 50% over the last decade. So for those of you who are students and are looking around going, wow, where did everybody come from? You can kind of see why this explains that. One of the approaches that universities have taken, whether they be big research intensi intensive universities like here at the University of Ottawa or small teaching intensive universities is to increase the class size. So we don't really need to debate what is a large class some universities would say that uh, an increase to 50 students would be considered a large class. Other universities might say that one, two, three, five, or many more could be considered a large class. Intuitively, people feel like, oh, that's bad. If we have too many people in the class, we can't learn. The bigger, the worse. Well, in fact, one of the things, one of the things we'll talk about today is that in fact, large doesn't necessarily have to be bad. And as I like to think about it, there's a lot of power in that large class. What do I mean by that? That the more people we have here in the classroom, the more opportunity we have to change minds, to change behavior, and ultimately to change the world. So in fact, the large class, maybe it's not what we imagine, the old kind of small space where a wise scholar would sit in the middle surrounded by interested students who listened closely. Maybe there was no technology involved, maybe it was just talking. We kind of imagine that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that was a good thing, nor that it was actually accurate. So why might that not be a good thing is one, it only allows some people to learn. And we could really say that that only allows an elite to be educated, and that allows only people that can either afford it or who have in some way access to university or college. So I don't think that's a good thing. I think that ac ed education should be accessible to everybody, and the more people educated, the more we have a chance to change society. The other thing is that, as I said on the previous slide, intuitively we think that, bad's, that large is bad and that small is good. But in fact, research doesn't support that. And probably your own experience as students doesn't, doesn't support it either. Because a professor who does an excellent job in a large class will create a really good learning experience. A professor who does a poor job in a small class will create a poor learning experience or contribute to a poor learning experience. So it's not really the size of the class that makes the difference to learning. Rather, it what goes, it's what goes on in the classroom. So today what I want to talk about in the amount of time that I have left is what we know and what we can do about building relationships in the large class 
and we're going to talk specifically about a concept called teacher immediacy, which is a concept from the, the field of communication called instructional, instructional development, which really looks at how do we communicate effectively in classes? How can we encourage learning and student engagement through our communication? So to do that really fast, I'm just going to say what we're going to cover. We're first going to talk about that connection in the large class and why it's important. Then we'll talk about teacher immediacy, and that's the term I just said is what we refer to these connections in the classroom. We call that teacher immediacy, so we'll talk about what does that look like. Then we'll talk about technology. It can be really bad and it can be really good, so we'll talk about how it can contribute or not to teacher immediacy. So connection in the large class. Well, what is that again? We said that that was called teacher immediacy. And what we study in communication in terms of teacher immediacy is what does that look like and what does that sound like? What are the behaviors that professors use when they're able to create teacher immediacy? What does it convey is that the professor shows through verbal and nonverbal behaviors that he or she is interested in connecting, interested in developing a relationship, interested in getting to know the students. If there's a huge mass out there, it's possible that not every single student will get known, will get to have a relationship directly with the professor. But the more that everyone has a sense of connection, the more that a number of good things will happen, which we'll look at in a sec. Most important, I'd say, is that this shows a desire to build a relationship. And we all know that when people like us, we tend to like them back. We humans are so responsive to each other's nonverbal and verbal signals that when someone conveys, I like you, we tend to be drawn in and we tend to like that person more. And we'll see why that benefits, for sure, the professors in a bit. This relationship is also critical to learning, though. And that's because learning is difficult. It's risky. It's not easy to look like you don't know something. It's not easy to struggle with a complex concept that you're trying to understand. It's not easy to struggle through difficult material that you might look like you don't know something or you don't know what you're talking about. So because learning is risky, it requires taking chances in the classroom, the more the students perceive that the professor is interested in them and cares about their learning, the more they're likely to take that risk and try something new, learn something new, or maybe even change a mental model or an idea they have. We've talked about really what is teacher immediacy and kind of what, how we define it. Now I want to talk briefly about why it matters so much and what the research shows happens when professors excel at building teacher immediacy in the classroom. We've seen that teacher immediacy is correlated with a whole bunch of good things, including learning, all kinds of learning, whether it be cognitive learning of complex information or effective learning, which is more our emotional connection with information, our desire to go try new things. It's also connected with student attendance. Students tend to come to classes where they feel that they have a more relationship with the professor. It's also related to student participation. Sometimes you might think, well, how could someone in a large class of 300, 400, how could they possibly participate, like putting up their hand, asking a question? Well, if you've been in large classes where that happens, you can see that, in fact, it can happen. Students do participate more when they perceive that the professor is interested in them. We also see student motivation. Why is that, do you think, that students are more motivated when they feel that the teacher or the professor is, in, is connecting with them more? Well, again, remember I said that we are human animals. We're social animals. We connect with each other, and we're sensitive to these subtle and not so subtle verbal and nonverbal signals. When we perceive that someone cares about us and likes us, we tend to be more responsive to what they would like us to do. And that really means that we're more persuasive when we are liked. So if the professor is trying to persuade, let's say, the students to study something, to read something, to think about something, to report on something, when the professor wants the student to do all that, the student is more motivated because they sense that they have this relationship. It also increases out-of-class communication, so that's the kind of talk that we have with our professors. So if you come and talk to your prof before class, after class, or in his or her office hours, all of this contributes actually to student engagement and to student learning. And lastly, and this is more in the interest of professors, is that teacher immediacy leads to better teacher evaluation. So profs who connect with their students tend to do better. Again, people who sense that we like them tend to like us. It's a reciprocal thing. All right, so moving along, what does it look like? I've already been demonstrating some of the teacher immediacy nonverbal skills that we'd be teaching someone if they were trying to improve their immediacy building ability. 
vocal variation, so changing your voice. Why? Because we tune out things that are monotone or that stay the same. We're attracted to things that change, like the voice. Smiling, it's so cheap, it's so easy. And it says so much. It says to audiences or students, I like you, I care about you, I like being here. Leaning into students. So I'm not going to demonstrate it because I don't have a whole lot of room to move here, but the simple change in backing up and furthering myself from the students, you can see how it increased distance between us. When I approached you, when I got closer, we can see how we, were, we feel more intimate, we feel more connected with each other. Facing the students, this is the one thing if professors simply changed, it would, it would really help. If they stopped turning around and looking at the screen and speaking to the screen, and instead just shifted their body and focused on the students. This is such a wonderful setup in the room right now where we've got the slide right here in front of me, so I'm cueing from that, and I'm spending all my time looking right out at you. Every time I turn and look back there, our connection's broken. So the more I'm looking at you, the more you are obliged to look at me because we, we have social rules and we tend to follow them. If you feel I'm looking right at you, you're not as inclined to check your phone, check your Facebook, snooze, because you feel like that's not very polite. So the more I'm looking at you, the more you feel like I better look at her. So decreasing any kinds of barriers between us. So that might mean removing uh, podiums or removing tables and desks between us. Little use of notes. The more I don't need my papers, the more I can communicate directly with you. All kinds of relaxed body gestures and body positioning like I've been demonstrating here. Verbal immediacy, it's a lot easier, I'd say, to do those nonverbal uh, techniques that we just talked about, but we can also do things like humor. We can use positive feedback, so that's saying, oh, I really like what you just said, I like your question, wow, I'm interested in what you have to say. Calling students by name, yeah, you might not be able to learn 400 students' names, but you can try to learn a few every class. Encouraging student input, asking for questions, asking for comments, and then looking positive while you respond and listen to those questions. So let's say I ask a question from someone in the back row. I want to look positive. Mm -hmm. Ooh, good, yeah. I want to look like that while I'm listening to the question because what am I saying? I like you and I like your question. Inclusive pronouns, I want to talk about us. I want to refer to us in our relationship. And I want to interact with students either before after the class, during the class, we can talk amongst ourselves in some way. It's not just the profs who should be doing all this, though. You may think, well, it's all the professor's responsibility, but students have a role to play here, too. They can't, professors can't build a relationship on their own. They need students to look at them, to look back, to smile, to ask a question, to participate in some way in the lecture. Why? Because it's a transaction. And that's what I'm going to ask you to do. Most of you are students, and you're sitting there thinking, well, that's hard for me to control my professor. Well, actually, the more you look at the prof and ask questions, engage in the, ex in the actual lec uh, lecture, the more the professor responds to that. Last thing I want to talk about, technology. It can be so bad. It can get in the way of teacher immediacy and get in the way of learning. You've all experienced this, like I demonstrated already when the professor faces the slide and all the focus is there. Also, the use of laptops, what we call unstructured laptop use, which is checking Facebook, it's checking eBay, you're buying and selling on eBay, you're texting people, you're watching videos, all of that stuff really distracts from learning and from attentiveness. What about if professors give out too much information? Some might wonder, well, if I put my slides up ahead of time or if I put a podcast up, won't that keep the students from coming to class? Yes, it will. If the professor doesn't add anything to the lecture, it doesn't add anything to being in the classroom, doesn't add value, well, yeah, why would students come to the class? If you put up your slides, you better be worth coming to see in the classroom. Last thing is that too much video, too much media, too much darkness can get in the way of our being able to communicate with each other. So I like to have lots of light so I can see you. Right now, I can see you out there, but we're not connecting like we would if you had some light on you as well. The good, though, is that technology can enhance teacher immediacy. When we think about all the things some of your professors are trying, emailing you, you emailing them, discussion boards perhaps on the web page, using blogs, using some sorts of in interactive information. Structured use of laptops, so that might mean when we ask the students to look something up and share it, to watch something on the laptop and discuss it. Simulations in the classroom, in-class virtual assignments where the students are asked to write something and submit it to the professor watching a video perhaps in a small group and discussing it, 
building and using web pages, and also some sorts of software, like for example, lecture tools, which I'm using in my class, we're trying it this semester as an experiment, where the students have an opportunity to ask questions throughout the whole lecture, flag slides as, I don't get that, submit work online that we read and respond to right directly back to them. So to wrap up, what I wanted to talk about today was how we can revision, how we can imagine the classroom, whether it's 300, 400, 500 students, how we can imagine that as a place where relationships can occur and learning is enhanced. As I said, it's not really something that only a few special people can do. Any professor who wants to develop relationships and uses those behaviors we talked about is going to find that his or her teaching experience for both the point of view of students and him or herself will improve. Again, anybody who uses the behaviors can get better, not just those who seem like naturally good teachers. And back to our point at the beginning, the better we have professors teaching, the more we have power to change the world. The more students are interested, they're listening, they're learning, they're thinking, and then they're going out there and they're making a difference. Until we connect with them and engage with them, we're not going to see the kind of change in the world that's possible when we look at the kind of people that you are. So I'd like to thank you very much for your time. It's been a great pleasure. We don't get to have a conversation right after, but I'll be hanging around somewhere over there waiting to talk to you on the break. So thank you very much.